Dev, it'll give you a little message. People who are here to the presentation on Reuben Lewis, The Forgotten Brother by Devaney Reber, who did an amazing amount of not only primary source research, but on the spot research and had as her guide, Jane Henley, who is a collateral descendant of Reuben Lewis. So there were family documents that they held that other people have not seen yet. So that made it even more amazing. I see you have more cheerleaders here, Devaney, <laughs> for your talk. And so this is sponsored by the Southwest region and our program for the next three months, Devaney, and then March 5th, we will join with the Southern Prairie region to hear from a member of the Osage tribe. And at the end of April, Jay will talk about trappers in Yellowstone. And it, a lot of it was because of the encouragement and the support of Kevin and B. Olson, because B. wrote and said, the pandemic may be somewhat in its endemic phase, but are we not going to have more Zoom presentations? And what we learned was that getting together on a Sunday afternoon like this from across the country really has a role, whether it's a pandemic or whether we're in the endemic phase or whether we just have flu, because it enables people to meet, to hear really interesting information and with support from people like Kevin and B, our treasury fortunately can support having these programs. So we do hope to continue and you will get the announcements again as they come up. But I think it probably is close to two, Jay? Yes. So Devaney, we invite you to talk about Reuben Lewis, the forgotten brother. Thank you. And if I can jump in real quick, I'll just give Devaney a little introduction. Um, I had the great fortune of being her mentor and advisor the last three years at BYU. She's a history and German studies uh, graduate from Brigham Young University. And about three years ago, she was in my U.S. history class, and I was just so impressed with her thinking and writing abilities. I asked her to be a TA. About that same time, Jane Henley had sent me her first box of materials related to Reuben Lewis. And so this has been a three or four year project, but Devaney hit the ground running and has just uncovered so much information. We're grateful to Aaron Flick and um, his research on the parents of Lewis and Clark and um, other people who made this possible. And the research is coming out in the February issue of We Proceeded On. Um, and so you'll all have an opportunity to read and enjoy learning about Reuben Lewis, the forgotten brother. But today we have the pleasure of having the author here in person. Uh, so we'll turn the time over to Devaney. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Buckley, for that kind introduction. Um, I am very grateful you're all attending my presentation today. I'm quite excited to share my research on Reuben Lewis, the younger brother of Meriwether Lewis. I'm very grateful to the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation Southwest region for hosting me today. This project, as was previously mentioned, has been a long process. I don't think I had any idea what I was getting myself into when I started my research as a 21-year-old undergraduate student at BYU. I would not be here today if it weren't for my wise and patient mentor, Dr. Buckley, who I'm sure you all know and are very fond of. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Dr. Buckley and I have the great honor of being published in We Proceeded On. 
Since our article will soon be available to everyone, I didn't want my presentation today to just be a re reiteration of what you'll be able to read later. And that is why today I would like to talk not only about Ruben Lewis, but also about my journey to discover him. So for that reason, I'd like to start not in 1777 when Ruben was born, but in 2019 when I first learned of him. Let me go to my next slide, there we go. Oh, one more back. So there's me and Dr. Buckley together. Um, I was a student at BYU when Dr. Buckley and I met, as he mentioned, and he asked me if I wanted to work on a project with him. He set down three giant boxes full of papers and said something along the lines of, I think these papers about, are about Meriwether Lewis's brother. Can you look through them and write an article about him? And here I have some of the uh, those boxes pictured as well. I had grown up in Switzerland, and so I knew very little about the Lewis and Clark expedition, let alone any obscure siblings the expeditioners might have had. I was starting from ground zero. For months, I poured over content in the boxes, which I learned were sources carefully collected by the lovely Jane Henley of Charlottesville. There are a few secondary sources about Reuben. Andrea Radkey wrote her master's thesis on him, and John Jackson has a short article on him that was published in 2012. My search took me to archives and libraries in Montana, Charlottesville, Richmond, and St. Louis. And here are a few of those places that I visited. Um, I went to the places that he lived. I read the letters that he wrote. And the more I came to know about Reuben, the more questions I had. What kind of man was he really? Like all historical figures, he lived a contradictory life of both good and bad choices. So today I'll present you some of the contradictions of Reuben's life so that you can decide for yourself what kind of person he was and why or if he is important. Let's first start with a brief timeline of Reuben's life for some context. Reuben Lewis was born almost the same year as the United States in 1777 in Locust Hill, Virginia. I actually had the chance, um, as was mentioned by Philippa earlier, to go visit this site um, a few years ago. I have here on the map, you can see um, that Locust Hill is located just west of Charlottesville in beautiful Virginia rolling hills. And this picture was taken right outside um, of where Reuben and Meriwether were both born. Um, this would have been the backyard that they would have had to play in as boys. Reuben was the youngest child of Lucy and William Lewis and just three years apart from Meriwether. The family's father, William, died when Reuben was only two from hypothermia after attempting to cross a frozen river. There are conflicting analyses about what brought William to the river that day, and Aaron Flick, who I think is on this call, just published an amazing article about this, and we proceeded on, and I highly recommend you read it. The facts remain that William fought for the Americans until at least 1776, most likely in a militia, and was one of the first brave signers of the Albemarle County Declaration of Independence. Shortly after his death, Lucy, a young and capable widow with three children, remarried their neighbor, John Marks, per the request of William on his deathbed, apparently. Marks led the family to the untamed wilderness of Georgia to start a new life, while Meriwether stayed behind to finish his schooling. It is unclear what made the when the family made the move, but tax records indicate that they, they were there at least by 1787. Reuben would have been just 10 years old when he made the six week trek across the infant nation. And I have here a map as well to show approximately 447 miles walking would be a long time. They took boats as well, um, but it was a long journey nonetheless. And here we have some tax records um, from John Marks when he was in Georgia. And you see here that he had lots of acres of land. The first is the best quality and the third is the worst, as well as 12 enslaved individuals that accompanied the family to start a tobacco plantation in Georgia. Unlucky yet again, Meriwether and Reuben lost their second father in 1791 to an unclear illness. The family returned to Virginia, Meriwether served in the army, became President Jefferson's private secretary and conducted his famous expedition. All the while it was Reuben who stayed at home as the oldest man in the family to take care of his family. In 1807, Reuben finally got a piece of the adventure and followed Meriwether to St. Louis when Meriwether was appointed governor of Upper Louisiana Territory. Reuben was appointed sub-agent to the Osage and joined George C. Sibley at Fort Osage to facilitate the 1808 Osage Treaty. Here's a, an image of Fort Osage today. And they worked very closely with William Clark who is pictured here as well. Um, this is the original picture um, of the signers of the Osage Treaty. And as you can see here, Reuben's name is actually misspelled and we'll get to why that is later. So maybe a little mystery for now. 
A year later, Ruben co-founded the St. Louis, Missouri Fur Company with big name partners like Manuel Lisa, William Clark, and Auguste Couto. He commanded a boat up the Missouri to Fort Mondan and later traveled to Three Forks near present day Montana. Disaster awaited Ruben and his entourage there. Um, the Blackfoot Confederacy, antagonized by white encroachment and incited by the British, attacked Reuben's men. It was at Three Forks where George Drouillard, the famous hunter of the Lewis and Clark expedition, was killed. Reuben and his men fought their way out of Montana quite literally and were met by a rescue party at Fort Mondon. It was here um, at Fort Mondon that Reuben first learned that Meriwether Lewis, his brother, had died eight months earlier under mysterious circumstances. The pictures I have here, um, this is a picture that I took when I was at Three Forks in Montana. And the fort that they built would have been located just about over here on this land in the middle. Um, rumor has it that they left in such a hurry, they left their anvil there and that it is still somewhere in this area. I looked for it when I was there and I was unfortunately not able to find it. So it's still out there if anyone's there <laughs> to visit. Um, Reuben returned home for a few months to tend to family matters after the death of his brother. But Virginia could not hold him long. In 1812, the St. Louis Missouri Fur Company was, was disbanded, and some of the partners formed the new and improved Missouri Fur Company. So they, ju they just got rid of the St. Louis part and made it a new company. The company hired Reuben as a clerk and set up to trap among the Arikara. From there, Reuben took a large hunting group to the Little Bighorn. I have a picture of the Little Bighorn here. This is a great map that shows some of the forts um, along the different rivers in the American West, and this red dot is approximately where the Little Bighorn is located. It's a tributary of the, uh, the Bighorn. But unfortunately, like I mentioned, disaster struck there again. The effects of the War of 1812 were greatly felt in the West, which may be a surprise to some. The British again incited native tribes to attack the Americans. The company returned and reported that the Arikara, Cheyenne, Hidatsas, Crows, and Arabahos were at war with America. Reuben returned home again, enlisted in the war, but likely too late to have seen any action. Having had a plethora of disastrous fur trade company experiences, Reuben still somehow found it in himself to return to the West again in 1816, a year after the war's conclusion. This time, he intended to act as an independent fur trader, but the U.S. government had other grander plans for him. As the Cherokee relocated from the eastern United States to the West, they settled among the Osage. The tribes clashed almost immediately, and Reuben was appointed Cherokee agent in 1817, which meant he acted as the liaison between the Cherokee Nation in the West, in Arkansas, and between the U.S. government. He was tasked with the impossible task of promoting peace between the two tribes. He served surprisingly successfully in this capacity until being called home to care for a sick family member in 1820. And here I have an image of the Trail of Tears, the infamous Trail of Tears, which was about 12 years after um, Reuben was appointed agent. The Cherokee that he was helping along the Arkansas were ones that had relocated to the West voluntarily. And down here, we have a primary source showing the number of different tribes in the Western region. Here are the Cherokees, if you look at the bottom right, are listed as having 3,600 souls. And that was in 1816. By the time that Reuben was appointed in 1817, there were 5,000 Cherokee in the region that he was responsible for. For the next three years, he was involved in some land speculation in Lawrence County, Arkansas, with a few fellow Indian agents. He traveled often in an attempt to secure more land, going at least to Washington, D.C. and Arkansas, but possibly other places as well. In 1823, he married his first cousin, Mildred Dabney, who was 13 years his junior, and they grew up together as friends. We don't know much about Mildred. Um, she was Lucy's niece, and the inscription on her gravestone does provide some insight into her character. So, sorry, this is kind of a sad slide with just a bunch of gravestones on it, but Mildred, his wife, is over here on the left, and I'll read what the inscription says. It says, of a strong and original mind, of delicate taste, of serious and devout piety, and of warm affections. She endured many afflictions, but those who loved her hope she has now entered into the rest that remaineth for the people of God. So it seems that she was devoutly Christian, um, that she had an original character, and that she suffered many afflictions in her life. We're not sure exactly what this is referring to, but it could be the fact that Reuben and Mildred never had any children. In 1835, Lucy, Reuben, and their, his oldest sister, Jane, so the two remaining children of William Lewis, petitioned the U.S. government for any land claims, um, any claims to land or money 
that were due from the state of Virginia and the federal government for the services of William Lewis in the Revolutionary War. The family claimed that he was a lieutenant in the Virginian Continental Line. They hired an attorney named Thomas Horde and tried to prove that William served in the military. They provided family heirlooms as evidence, such as a letter that William had written to Lucy about his trip movements in 1776. In 1842, so seven years later, the Committee on Revolutionary Claims rejected the Lewis family's claim and even went as far as to accuse them of making an imposition on Congress. They could find no officer named William Lewis in any regiment of the Virginia line at any period of the war. Over two decades later, another opinion was issued. This finding conceded that it was possible that William had served in the militia, which we do think he did until about 1776, but that there were other discrepancies in the family's claim that made it, quote, a bad one. It even suggested that Lucy was being forced to petition for this money by a greedy speculator. This whole episode seems quite odd, and it is unclear whether the Lewises intended to see the American government or not. The final claim that was issued um, was issued after Reuben and Lucy would never be able to learn about it. Lucy had died in 1837, and that same year, Reuben started to receive medical treatment, but no record has remained of what particular malady he suffered from. The doctor started coming more frequently, and Reuben passed away three, year, or three days after his 67th birthday in 1844. And his tombstone is this one in the middle. And we'll get to that inscription later in the presentation as well. Um, while the Lewises died childless, it is possible that they raised Mildred's cousin, um, who was also named Mildred and was an orphan. Her gravestone is here on the right. Um, she died when she was only 19, a year after Reuben, and is buried next to her aunt at the Locust Hill Cemetery. And that's actually an insight that's not in my paper. I came across this picture when I was researching for this presentation and realized that she may have been raised by the Lewises. So I'll look more into that and let you know what I find out. Um, with a brief timeline, while a brief timeline is necessary, let me go back so you can see it. It does lose some of the complexity of Ruben's experiences. And so for the most, the rest of my presentation, I'd like to examine three contradictions of Ruben's life. First, was he a dedicated son, brother, and husband, or was he an absent career-focused businessman? Secondly, was he a man of principle who stood up for what was right, even when it was difficult, or was he a bystander to injustice? And finally, is it possible that he was both a slave owner and a slave advocate? With that, let's delve deeper into some of Ruben's contributions and some of his failures. So we'll start here with the case for a dedicated son, brother, and husband. And let's start first by showing you a family tree that I put together quickly, so hopefully it all makes sense. Um, in the middle, we have Lucy. Her first marriage to William Lewis um, produced Jane Anderson, the oldest um, child of the, of the marriage. And it seems that she was married pretty young and wasn't that close for that reason with Meriwether and Reuben. As we'll see, Meriwether and Reuben were good friends. Um, and her second marriage, John Marks, produced John H. Marks and Jerry G. Mark, or Mary G. Marks, who would have been half siblings to Meriwether and Reuben. One of my favorite parts of researching Reuben was reading the letters between him and his siblings. Reuben spent a lot of time away from home, and his letters reveal brotherly banter and an undeniable closeness to his siblings. His letters show that despite physical distance, he kept on, up on his family's lives often following up on small details or asking to write them to write him a long letter, quote, about anything or nothing at all. The particular closeness between Meriwether and Reuben is found in Meriwether's letter letters to his family in Georgia. The brothers parted when Reuben was only 10, and it seems that Reuben really missed him. He often asked Meriwether to come visit them in Georgia. Meriwether always checked in on Reuben's schooling with Lucy and signed his letters off to Reuben as your affectionate, ever-loving brother. When Meriwether was away on the expedition, he gave power of attorney to his brother Reuben, not another friend, not an older neighbor, but to Reuben, revealing a high level of trust. Thomas Jefferson and Reuben wrote constantly while Meriwether was on his expedition, and Reuben was always eager to hear about his brother's adventures. Upon his return from the West, it was Reuben who brought all of Meriwether's belongings to St. Louis for him on a boat. Tragically, Reuben's last letter to Meriwether was sent after Meriwether had already died. Reuben was out west with the Missouri Fur Company at the Three Forks and did not learn of Meriwether's death until the rescue party came for them. One report indicates that Reuben traveled alone to the site of Meriwether's death in Tennessee in an attempt to make sense of his brother's sudden and unexpected death. 
Reuben's letters to his half-sister Mary indicate that he felt no lack of closeness to her despite sharing different fathers. There's one sentence from one of his letters to her that I just love. It says, quote, if anything should turn up in your situation, do let me have the earliest inclination of it, as I feel extremely interested in anything that concerns your future happiness. Her name was Mary, but he had a nickname for her and called her Polly. He signed his letters to both his half-siblings, John and Polly, as your friend and brother. For a long time, Reuben had been aware of his brother's poor health. Although the cause of his poor health was not explicitly stated in their letters, he and Reuben talk about it in every correspondence to each other. But once um, in 1819, Reuben received a letter that was quite different while he was acting as Cherokee agent. This letter was not sent by his brother, John, but by a family friend. I'll quote it here. It said that Mark's situation, quote, has become to appearances hopeless. His insanity has assumed a dangerous appearance so that it has been found necessary to confine him. You will now consider yourself the only prop of your family. Your mother yesterday requested that you might be immediately informed and that you would hasten to their relief. Your mother's firmness is much weakened. Since writing above, the doctor, referring to John Marks, who also was a doctor, has escaped from his friends and has not been heard of. This is the first time that we learned that it was actually a severe mental illness that John was dealing with, and this had been the health situation that had been accompanying him all his life. Upon receiving this letter, Reuben requested leave from his position at the end of the year so the Cherokee would not be left without an agent. He was willing to leave a $1,500 salary and the prestige of Indian agent to take care of his brother, who was obviously suffering greatly from mental illness. Reuben also seemed to have been very a very dedicated son to his twice-widowed mother, Lucy. Due to both father's early deaths and Meriwether's work in military absence from home, Reuben took the lead on family affairs for at least a decade in his late teens and early 20s. He paid for his half-brother John Mark's medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania, settled land and finances after his stepfather's death, and acted as a witness for his family members' legal needs. Reuben carried, or cared for Lucy in her old age, and is buried next to her at Locust Hill. One of his last acts in life was to have two portraits of his late mother copied from an earlier painting, um, quite possibly this very one that's shown here. Although Reuben and his wife Mildred, or Millie as Reuben called her, had no children, the inscription that she left on his tombstone indicates a deep closeness. It says, "The monument. this monument is erected by one who can never cease to mourn his loss. It's short, but I think it really illustrates the closeness that they felt for each other. Reuben's most questionable family behavior, now to flip the coin on the other side, comes at the end of his life. Perhaps he was acting out of self-interest, but perhaps we just don't have all the sources that would provide some clarity into the reality of the situation. Reuben began a personal land speculation project as early as 1818 while working as Indian agent to the Cherokee. He and his partners, who consisted, consisted of other agents and factors, began to buy up land in the West to sell as lots to emigrating Americans. Although Reuben left the West officially to care for his sick brother, his correspondence indicates that he remained heavily involved in his land speculation efforts while at home. In fact, less than a year after returning home to supposedly care for his family, Reuben was already back in Arkansas to meet with his partners about their land. While Reuben wrote about his land and traveled on business often, the family sent John H. Marks to receive medical care at City Hospital in Baltimore. And I have that hospital picture here. This is a picture taken much, much later, so it probably didn't look as grand at the time that um, John was sent there. It is the second oldest psychiatric hospital in the country. It is unclear what motivated the Lewis family to send John so far away. Perhaps it was the best available care, or perhaps they had grown weary of John's episodes. Regardless, it did not seem that John received the best care there. He became paranoid that the doctors were trying to poison him, so he stopped taking his medicine and died due to some illness that caused swollen limbs. Due to poor management, the hospital had lost Reuben's address and could not inform him of the funeral. John was buried alone the day before Reuben married Mildred, coincidentally. Six years later, the state of Maryland took over City Hospital due to growing concerns about its very poor conditions. It does seem that Reuben chose to focus his energy and efforts on buying land and not on caring for John. To his credit, however, I cannot find any letters that he wrote about his land speculation after he learned about John's death. It seems at least possible that his brother's death was so impactful on him that he gave up on his land speculation efforts. Or, of course, the letters have been lost. It's hard to tell with primary sources. 
On to the next contradiction, whether Reuben was a man of principle who stood up for what was right or whether he was a bystander to injustice. Reuben's first employment in the West was under George C. Sibley. I have a picture of him here as assistant agent to the Osage. The Osage were one of Meriwether's first major concerns when he took office in St. Louis. They were attacking fur traders and other native tribes, rendering the, the West a place that was not safe for business. To curb this violence and reopen the West to the fur trade, Reuben and Sibley worked with William Clark to facilitate the 1808 Osage Treaty. The problem with this treaty is that it was horribly unfair to the Osage and the US counterparts knew it. Later in life, Clark said that the 1808 Osage Treaty that Reuben helped facilitate was the hardest treaty on the Indians he ever made and that if he was to be damned hereafter, it would be for making this treaty. It is unclear how involved Reuben and Sibley were both political manipulations, threats, and exaggerated accusations of Osage crimes, the U.S. pressured the Osage to sign a treaty that took much more land from them than they had even comprehended. In fact, much of the difficulty Reuben had a decade later as Cherokee agent stemmed from this treaty. It had not been explained to the Osage that when they ceded their land that other tribes such as the Cherokee would be allowed to settle there. They thought this treaty meant they would just have to share this land with whites and perhaps with other tribes who were already in the area. Even a decade later, the Osage were still learning about all that they had lost. Clark knew it was unfair and even boasted to Congress that it should have required five times the price to buy the land secured by the treaty. One of Reuben's first professional acts was involvement in this dubious agreement. Of course, he was a junior agent and was probably not even at the actual signing of the treaty in St. Louis. So here I have the image I showed you later of the actual signatures of some of the Osage as well as the American counterparts. The Osage, many of them just signed their name with an X, as you can see here. And what you might find interesting is that Reuben's name is misspelled as Raisin Lewis, um, indicating that someone who did not know him well signed on his behalf. Regardless, there is no record that Reuben disapproved of the unfairness of this treaty or ever spoke out against it. Reuben found himself in a similar situation on his second business venture as a junior partner of the St. Louis, Missouri Fur Company. The maiden voyage of the St. Louis, Missouri Fur Company was controversial to say the least. It was headed by the infamous Manuel Lisa, and it was a business venture, in quotations, um, dressed up as a political mission so that it could receive government funding and an advantage over other fur trade companies. The first and last tour of the company included, included returning Chief Sheheke to his tribe after he had accompanied Lewis and Clark to meet President Jefferson and fur trade at Fort Mondon, at the Three Forks in present-day Montana, on the Columbia River. Reuben commanded a boat of Americans who were especially unhappy about the poor treatment the American crew was receiving. His boat was almost always the last one to arrive at camp. Lisa insisted it was because of the laziness of Reuben's men and did not blame Reuben. Reuben's men insisted it was because they had a heavier boat and lower quality food than the others and did blame Reuben. According to Thomas James, who was the boat steerman, Here's a picture of him here, I believe. There he is. Reuben let them down on three occasions. At one point, one of the senior partners asked Reuben to make an especially troublesome crew member leave the party. Despite being 1,400 miles from St. Louis, Reuben not only obeyed, but also took the crew member's gun, essentially sentencing the, death, the man to death on the frontier. Only an armed protest from his crew convinced Reuben to let the man stay. On a second occasion, a great wind forced the boats upstream, leaving Thomas James ashore while he was hunting. Lewis's men pleaded with him to wait for their steersmen, but Reuben was either unwilling or unable to disagree with the partner's desire for speed and left James behind. A week later, an emaciated and shoeless James finally caught up with the boats. Finally, when the company reached Fort Mondon, the partners refused the crew members the traps, ammunition, and guns that they had been promised when they had left St. Louis. The crew was left without provisions or weapons and had to buy these necessities back from the company at great personal cost. In fact, when James returned home, Thomas James, the steersman, pictured here, he was $300 in debt and he had intended to make a profit. James, who knew Reuben best of all the partners, since he was the only, uh, since he was on Reuben's boat, believed that while the primary blame rested on Lisa, quote, the rest of the company must suffer the stigma of having connived and profited by the villainy. 
As a junior partner, it is clear that Rubin was not involved in the disastrous decision-making of the other more senior partners. However, it does seem damning that the main primary account of this expedition was written by someone on Rubin's boat and that James made zero flattering remarks about Rubin. It seems here that Rubin stood by as injustice happened and in some cases even facilitated it. And now to flip, flip that coin and talk about the cases when Rubin did stand up for what was right. Later in life, when Rubin was no longer a junior partner, but the only Arkansas Cherokee in 1817, he would have the chance to prove if he would copy the questionable practices of his first two jobs or if he would forge his own path. Luckily, it appears the more influence Rubin had, the more he tried to act with fairness and compassion. The settlement of the Cherokee on the ceded Osage land led to disaster. Here I have some picture, pictured some Osage tribesmen and women. The two tribes reacted violently towards each other, and Reuben was appointed to mediate the conflict right when it was deemed an unpreventable and fast approaching bloody war. Unfortunately, William Clark, who was now the Missouri territorial governor at the time, believed that preventing war was not the best solution. In fact, he stated that encouraging war between native tribes would be better for white Americans. I think the thinking here was that the native tribes would be too busy fighting each other to fight the Americans. Reuben, however, did not share the same mindset and did all he could to promote peace among the Osage and the Cherokee. With 6,000 Cherokee under his jurisdiction, he facilitated a vital peace treaty in 1819 that resulted in the return of stolen property and prisoners. And he established a method for native tribes to report attacks to Reuben and the Osage agent instead of taking personal revenge. Besides fostering peace, even when his superiors advised against it, Reuben attempted to keep American promises when other American leaders did not. When the federal government failed to send the pledged $4,000 of annuity to the Quipaw, a small tribe in the area, Reuben reminded the Secretary of War relentlessly that it was missing. Reuben came across an emigrating party of 211 Eastern Cherokee, who he described as almost without provisions. He immediately provided them with keelboats. I have some keelboats pictured here. I'm sure you as the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation know well what a keelboat looks like. Um, and he provided them also, also with provisions for the rest of their travels. And he did this without asking permission from the federal government first. He wrote to the Secretary of War afterwards that since the president had promised the Cherokee, quote, every faculty in removing to this country, and it seemed that they had not received that promise, he felt justified in his decision. Despite his initial introduction to American Indian relations as one as a rather dubious one, when Reuben was in charge, it appears that he treated the Cherokee with fairness and respect. It seems that they felt similarly about him. They requested he be the one that accompanied them on their diplomatic mission to Washington, D.C., even though they knew he was soon retiring from his post. For the final contradiction of Reuben's life, I would like to talk about how he was both a slave owner and possibly if you can be a slave owner and a slave advocate, also a slave advocate. Reuben was born into a slave owning family. He continued the practice. He continued to practice slavery all his life. He bought and sold and owned slaves until the day he died. The primary sources I found provide little detail about the stories of these enslaved individuals, but I wanted to share the information that I do have about them. When Reuben's father, William, died, he left behind, behind 24 enslaved individuals. In Georgia, young Reuben, his family, and 12 enslaved Africans cultivated 290 acres of wilderness, converting it into tobacco plantation. And tobacco is the crop I have here pictured on this slide. It appears that the other 12 um, enslaved individuals were sold. Perhaps many of them were too young to make the long journey or too young for the hard work that awaited them in Georgia. I found an undated list of slaves that were for sale on lot number one, and I estimate that these were the 12 slaves the Lewis family did not take with them to Georgia. I'd like to take a moment to read their names and their ages. Frankie, who is a mother, 33 years old, and her baby. Millie, who is 13. Robert was seven. Edmund was five. Henry was just two and a half. Mal was 34. Jefferson, 12. Peter, 10. Frederick was seven. Matthew was four. Elizabeth was two and Old Millie was 49. The slaves were listed for a total of $3,325, but it seems that they were available for individual purchase as well. A sickening thought, since some of them were just children. I think I have a picture of that sale right here. So here you can see lot number one, the names of the slaves, 
their ages, and the cost estimated for each one, as well as the total. It appears that Lucy left several slaves in Georgia to care for the Millstone Creek estate when she returned to Virginia. They were there for at least three years, and maybe longer. I found one letter written by one of Lucy's former slaves, asking about Isabella and the rest of the family, dated 1794. It is unclear from the evidence that I do have, but it appears that the writer of this letter, Uncle Paul, was sold to another slave owner and wrote to Lucy to see how a slave family was doing, quite possibly his own family. I do not know if Lucy responded. In his adulthood, I have records of Reuben purchasing three slaves. He bought Caddy and her son Lewis from his mother for 110 pounds, and he bought a 22-year-old man named Mace in St. Louis in 1818. This is while he was serving as Indian agent, so it is unclear whether Mace, or Mason as he was also known, came with Reuben to the Cherokee Agency or went to Virginia for, with the rest of the Lewis family. Lucy and Reuben used slaves to pay off debts to a man named Sidney Reese in 1817. They sent Tom, who was 32, Isaac, who was 14, Dolly, who was 12, and a man named Dangerfield, whose age I do not know, to Washington, D.C. to settle their debt. When Reuben died, he left behind 10 slaves. While no amount of slave advocacy can justify also being a slave owner, I would like to point out a few key moments in Reuben's life where he advocated for the safety of enslaved individuals. While serving as Cherokee agent, Reuben learned of a horrific murder that really affected him. A Cherokee woman had beheaded one of her male slaves as a form of punishment. Reuben noticed a similar pattern of poor treatment of slaves among the Cherokee and wrote to Washington, D.C. calling for a federal law to protect slaves among the native tribes. He wrote, quote, there is no law or custom among the Cherokee to protect the lives of that poor, unfortunate part of the human species, which in my opinion, calls upon the humanity of our government to put an end to. Later, when he returned home to Virginia, I mentioned early, earlier that he and his mother used slaves to pay off debt. Both he and Lucy were in debt together, almost $3,000 of debt. To put that into perspective, that would have been two full years of Reuben's salary as Indian agent, which was a very good salary. Reuben sent four slaves to Sidney Reese, the man they owned this debt to, and expressed a sense of closeness to these slaves, stating, quote, I have no doubt that their situation will be as good or better than it has hitherto been, which reconciles me in parting with them. When Reese asked for two more slaves, Sam and Lindsay, to settle the debt, Reuben refused stating that, quote, they had wives and would not willingly go unless exchanges could be made so as to accommodate them. Despite the crushing de debt that Reuben and his mother faced, Reuben would, not send two of Reuben would not send two of his enslaved men unless their wives could accompany them, illustrating at least some respect in this instance for family ties. Although it seems quite possible the slave families of the Lewises were split up on many other occasions. These two examples are but glimpses of humanity in the long, and tragic story of American slavery. Unfortunately, there are no remaining paintings of Reuben that have been discovered. I'm still holding out hope that one might show up somewhere. <laughs> um, so not only do we have to guess what he looked like, but it seems we must also make an educated guess about what kind of man he was. Reuben was not just important because he was the little brother of famous Meriwether. He is important because he found himself at the crossroads of so many vital themes in American history family, business and enterprise, the Revolutionary War, politics, Native American relations, and slavery. I hope this presentation not only sheds light on Reuben and the Lewises, but as a glimpse into the grander themes of the American story as well. Thank you very much. That's all I have for you today, but I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Devney, maybe you can uh, stop sharing your screen and then people can see everybody. There we go. Well, thank everybody for listening to this great presentation. Thank you, Aaron said he heard you when you gave it on the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation platform. He said, but you know what? I'm gonna hear it again. <laughs> so. And he appreciates, I'm sure, your acknowledgement of 
his important work on the fathers. And so were there any questions about it? Were, were there any portraits in life done? Of uh, Ruben? Yes. I have not found any um, or heard of any. If anyone knows of any leads, you know, a, a painting in their attic that might be Ruben, let me know. But I, for now, we don't have any paintings of him. So where do you come down on the man he was after you limb the disparities? Yeah, I think like most people in history, um, he was a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. And I understand um, that he was a man of his time, but I'm also grateful for the times that he overcame that and did the right thing, even when he had poor examples around him. I mean, we love William Clark, um, but he wasn't always the best example in terms of Indian relations. And it was really impressive to see Reuben, who was much his junior and who looked up to him, decide, for example, not to promote war between the Osage and the Cherokee, even if it would have benefited, benefited white Americans. Well, if he'd stepped up to the plate in uh, censuring their treatment of their Black slaves, mm -hmm. that slavery, it, it's an acknowledgement that having his own slaves were wrong and but and mistreating people who have no recourse. And I think he was very clear on that. He was very clear on when the Cherokee came through and he was able to give them supplies when they had run very short. And I think the that family from your reinforcement, it was very long on familial devotion. I mean, certainly Meriwether wrote as often as he could to his mother, and she figured very prominently there is a strain of psychiatric illness. Mm -hmm. And since maybe it was on both sides, John Marx fared poorly himself. It may have been more a reflection of Lucy's family than um, the Lewis or the Marx part of it, since yes. two of her natural born children. But it's details like these that makes people come alive. But for all the being at Three Forks in that year of living dangerously, was Reuben lucky? Did he mm -hmm. believe in God? At our um, previous secretary, Larry McClure, has started ruminating about that. Mm. You know, Mark Jordan gave his talk on how lucky were these men and women because there were so many near misses. You talk about the spirituality of the Indians since they had their own belief system. So it's hard to say that the belief system of uh, the people on the expedition protected them, but there are just too many near misses to think that whether they were on the side of right or not, there was perhaps a divine intervention on their part right. side. Yes, it's it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell how religious of a man Ruben was. He doesn't seem to mention any religious factors in his letters, but as I mentioned, his wife seems to have been a very devout Christian. Um, it does also seem that Ruben was perhaps um, more humble and cautious than some of the other people that were with him on the expedition. For example, George Druyard, who is the famous hunter of the Lewis and Clark expedition, he died at the Three Forks under Ruben's command after being given explicit commandment not to leave the fort alone. But he did anyways, thinking that he was too good at hunting and trapping to be caught by the Blackfoot Confederacy. So I think that Reuben also took fewer risks perhaps um, than other people who were along with him. Oh, I did, I did not see that. that you quoted Druya as being quoted as saying he was too much of an Indian to be yes. taken out by Indians, but the fact 
but that's an interesting fact that that people who are perhaps more prudent mm -hmm. um, may and think quickly but mm -hmm. because Druya was so well known for his tracking abilities that when he was attached to the fort, people would only desert when he was gone. Mm. They would not leave if he were around to track them down and bring them back. So it's an interesting thought. It's hard to say because there were so many belief systems at play at the time mm -hmm. and people had positive and negative experiences among the Native Americans, among the Euro-Americans, but it's, it's a thought that uh, might be worth pursuing, but you know more about Ruben than anybody, probably have read more of his letters than anybody, and that doesn't come out in his letters. So it's, it's it's an interesting consideration. Yeah, and I always wonder how many letters we don't have. I know that at some point there was a fire at the location where Ruben's letters were kept. So I know that some of them were lost. And even some of the letters that I did find had burn marks on them. So I couldn't read them in completion. So I it's it makes me sad to think about all the things I might not know about Ruben. So hopefully some more things show up as time goes on. Well, in this upcoming WPO is also the almost published journals. The seven journal keepers were noted. We don't even know who the seventh is by name. There's speculation. But the chance that things might still turn up is ever present. Mm -hmm. White House's journal in a published form was found in a bookstore in Philadelphia in 1966. And there's the famous field notes of Clark that showed up in an attic, in a desk in mm -hmm. St. Paul, Minnesota. So Jay, what's the speculation about how that got there? Do you, do you know? You'll have to read my book. <laughs> um, I'd have to refresh the details to get all of the facts straight. So don't want to speak out of turn. But um, what happened was sometime after the St. Louis records, they were moving from place to place as the agency um, changed locations. Um, some eventually made it all the way to Topeka, Kansas. And that's when the Kansas State Historical Society uh, purchased some of them. There were others that were destroyed um, in by fire on purpose um, when they were cleaning out some uh, materials from the homes of where the um, administrators had stayed. And the last administrator took some personal effects, and those are the ones that included um, Clark's journal that ended up in Minnesota. And so that's recapped in a WPO article I wrote, my very first one back in 2001, um, called um, The Price of Used Paper, if you want to read it on the Lewis and Clark website. So hope springs eternal that more will turn up. Although and they, <laughs> they always do. Um, I just had a, a journal of William H. Ashley was discovered by the Campbell House around 2010. We published oh. it in 2014 in the Rocky Mountain Fur Trade Journal. This was a journal that William H. Ashley kept in 1826. Um, and so they do appear even as recently as 10 years ago. Well, I think, remember when Lewis bemoaned that he, the, a trunk of his papers fell in the drink in the Potomac when they were being transported? That's why Gary Moulton has donated his papers to the special collections at the library at Lewis and Clark College, and he drove them himself 
from Nebraska to Portland, Oregon, not taking a chance that they would wind up in the drink if he had them shipped. So we do learn from history. So we're not always destined to repeat the mistakes. If some but of the participants have questions, um, they can either unmute themselves or write them in the chat room and we can see them there as well. Well, maybe we could ask Aaron, a, a lot of his information is in the article he published in WPO about uh, the Lewis boy's father, and it was from the physician's day book. Aaron, how did you come across that primary document that gave you so much information? <clears throat> that's a that's a question I, I'm sure I'm not sure I can actually answer. I'm trying to remember. I think that the, the uh, there was awareness. I think I discovered it via Jefferson because uh, it had been known for years that uh, uh, this man uh, George Gilmer had treated a physician had treated Jefferson, and it occurred to and that the day book existed. Um, and uh, it just occurred to me that since uh, William Lewis was lived very close to where Jefferson lived, uh, the families knew each other that probably Gilmer had treated William Lewis as well. And um, and I had at that point, I had to uh, actually I was early in the pandemic and I had to um, ask the, the Library of Virginia to uh, or actually the University of Virginia Library uh, to send um uh, to send a uh, uh, a copy of it, um, they they wouldn't uh, email me a PDF, uh, but they sent it to the Huntington near where I live, and uh, so I was able to read it that way. It's now in PDF form and and uh, and more available. So I mean, I think that's one of the kind of exciting things about doing history. Um, my training is as is in English uh, English literature, and um, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on documents. It was mo mostly when I was in grad school. It's mostly theory. Uh, but when you start doing history, you know, you, you see that there are tons and tons of documents out there that either have not been looked at or, you know, they have kind of gathered dust and uh, uh, and others that, you know, we just uncover for the first time. So it's um, it's very exciting or it can be. It can also be very there can be a lot of drudgery, too. You can, I'm I'm working on right now. I'm just a very small project I'm working on. A, and stop me if I'm babbling. But uh uh, we we have a pretty good sense of Meriwether Lewis's ancestry, except one line. There's if you look at his great grandparents, his eight great grandparents, seven of the eight are very well known, and the eighth is sort of mysterious. And I've been working to try to uh, figure out exactly who uh, this Ann Holmes figure, who is supposed to have been the grandmother of Lucy, uh, on her I think on her maternal side, um, and it's. It's really kind of fun to work on, but you when you when you start trying to track down documents in colonial Virginia, particularly in the 18th and early the late 17th century, so many have been destroyed by fire, um, and it just uh, you just it's it, it's ner it's just hair pulling time because you you as you said, Devaney, I mean you want documents to be there and they just aren't always there. But in any event, just a lot of a lot of excitement, also punctuated by a certain amount of uh, of ennui as you just can't find the things you're looking for. I was going to ask Devaney, what's next? Um, grad school, I guess, right? Or if you're in and uh, do you see this project expanding and are you going to take my bait and uh, look at the Clark siblings? Because that that's uh, that's a book length project there. Yes, I'm, I'm currently working, taking a break from school for a moment. I'm working in, in Salt Lake in Utah, um, but I am planning on doing a master's degree um, in history. And we'll see if I continue to um, research the American West. But even just like I said, while creating this uh, presentation, some questions came up um, that I had never considered before. And so there's always more to learn. And I look forward to demystifying those questions as well. Well, I think we have to thank Jay for hosting. It's much appreciated. And Jay will be back on April 30th.
for as much as the frustration is about limited primary sources, he will address three trappers in Yellowstone who left quite a bit, including, including poems. So the challenge was different to make your way through all the documents and put together a cohesive story of people who made their way to Coulter's help when nobody believed him when he came and found his way out of Yellowstone. And on the 5th, the Southern Prairie chapter and Dan Sturdivant will be hosting a member of the Osage tribe who will talk about their encounters with Lewis and Clark on their way to the Western waters. So, Jay asks if you can see the chat box, what's something you learned today about Ruben that you didn't know previously? You mean besides everything? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you knew that Meriwether Lewis had a brother? <laughs> <laughs> I think Jerry knew. He also had an older sister, of course, who you touch on, and and there's probably more to be to be written about her. I mean, she certainly had a more placid life than uh, than her brothers did, uh, or to all appearances. But uh, and then, of course, there was a, a another sister named Lucinda who uh, was between Jane and Meriwether, who who only lived about a year, um, and. Uh, but Jane's certainly somebody you could think about, too. Well, I think the amazing thing is that Reuben went back <laughs> to trapping. Mm -hmm. Once when um, at a neurosurgery conference, the resident presented a case and the question to the chairman of the department Charlie Wilson, who was part Cherokee, that makes this relevant, was, should I operate again? And Charlie said, Daniel came out of the lion's den once. <laughs> and in spite of Daniel, Reuben went back with almost the same experience. And so I think that's I mean, th maybe the lure of riches was enough. He didn't make quite as much, but to to have people brave known dangers that they really have very little control over except staying inside the fort. And I do mention that a little bit in my paper um, as well, that Reuben's first father, his inheritance most likely would have gone to Meriwether according to Virginian law. Um, and then Reuben's second father left all of his inheritance to his actual son. So Reuben was the only son who didn't get anything from either of his fathers. And so it is possible that the need to make money, make a living, make a name for himself is what drove him to the West so many times. And does seem also that he was quite the outdoorsman. I mean, it's funny that Meriwether became the one that's famous for being the outdoorsman because it was, it was um, Reuben who grew up in Georgia in the untamed wilderness out there. And Meriwether always wrote to Reuben that he was jealous of his fishing and hunting and time outside because, of course, Meriwether was busy taking lessons um, in Virginia. And so, yeah, it is interesting that he kept going back, but maybe he saw it as his only choice um, when it came to making a name for himself. How did you find his style in, when you read his letters? Yeah, he's um he's actually funnier than I was expecting him to be. Um, there is one line that I love where he says um, he's been in the West for a while and I think he's feeling a little bit forgotten by his family and by his friends. And so he um, sends a letter to Polly, Mary G. Marks, and says, tell everyone that remembers me that, you know, I, I love them and everyone who's forgotten me can go to dot, dot, dot. That's what he writes. <laughs> well, so he, he all wrote, he, when, when he was laid up for two weeks when he had injured his leg, he wrote to his mother and he said, but I'm not doing anything. So all I could write is about myself and I've done quite enough of that already. <laughs> so you're, you're right. He has a combination of humility and bravura. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think you, you did get 
a sense of his personality. It, he didn't have the academic background, so he seemed a lot less stuffy than Merriweather. <laughs> Yes, that is true. We know that he took some lessons from the same tutors that taught Merriweather, but definitely not as many. Um, and he does have a good amount of um, grammatical and spelling errors in his letters. Um, so I would say medium educated. But even with that, that because it was the only way to communicate, that's what they did. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't put them off. Mm -hmm. Or Clark, for that matter. <laughs> Well, I think that everyone is in agreement. Gary Point has written to thank you and Jay for giving us all this incredible information. I feel like I've done a spoiler alert in telling people what is going to be in the February WPO, but the, the wealth of detail that Devaney and Jay have assembled is really staggering. And it's beautifully illustrated, I have to say, in part with period pictures and a lot with Devonese photographs. So it it's just no WPO is on its way. It'll take a little while, may not be February, but it'll be worth waiting for because and the the uh, registration form for the meeting is also in the WPO. So you'll get, either go to lewisandclark.org and please register for the annual meeting, which will be June 27th to 30th in Missoula. So the theme is the crossroads that Traveler's Rest became and they're planning a great program. Please register, it helps them with early registration so they will have cash, which is important to start paying the bills as they come in. And there is a choice of field trips and a choice of walking tours. So if you wanna get your first choice, please register as soon as possible and plan to come. And then we could join Jay in migrating over to Great Falls. Jay has been invited to give the keynote speech for the 25th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark Interpreter Center. <laughs> that is a big deal because the community had to raise, it was a cost sharing, the community raised half the amount. So the run up to the opening in 1998 was amazing because of the participation. We were there in 1999. We had no clue about getting ready for the bicentennial. And what they, they you have to keep changing, but what they took down was as you enter, for those of you who have been there, was a giant overhead sign. How do you plan for an expedition when you don't know where you're going, you don't know what you'll need, you don't know whom you'll meet, and you don't know how long you'll be away? And that was Lewis's charge. And when you think about it that way, you realize how amazing he was and that only one man died when you compare it with the Astoria expedition that lost people right and left, you realize Lewis's greatness as not only a planner and Clark, but the responsibility they felt for the people under their command, all the people, whether they were soldiers or the engagés, or the Sacagawea and the baby, certainly, Charbonneau. So there are many things that are extremely admirable about the people involved with their clay feet 
and all. And going forward, we acknowledge, as Devaney alluded to, Reuben had slaves, Meriwether had slaves, Clark had slaves. They did. And yet they also not only took care of their men, but admired the Indians they met. You could just imagine they're sitting in dismal niche. It's my favorite image of the whole thing. They don't know. <laughs> they're like, how the F are we going to get to the other side? And meanwhile, the Clatsop and the Nahalem are just zipping in and out of the waves in these huge 20-person canoes. And they're like, huh? So they appreciated how how well adapted the people were or going hunting in the freezing cold where the Indians had no saddles, they gripped with their knees and were hunting buffalo with bow and arrow and they didn't have to hold on to the reins. So there, if anyone says, as people are trying to, that Lewis and Clark had an adversarial relationship, they didn't. They admired people who were good at what they did. So I think going forward, that's also the charge of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, which is to get this word out there and not let it be, these people be tarnished and take away the good that they did feel toward people who were different from themselves and the admiration. So this is Sunday, you've heard a sermon, and but, but I think the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation in thinking of how to proceed on has to take a tack like this and acknowledge who they were, but really let people know what they were in addition. So. Thank you, Please. Philippa. Thanks for the um, Southwest chapter and all of the rest of you who joined us. We're so thankful that Devney was willing to speak with us and share this great research she's been doing since 2019. We um, encourage you to keep your eyes peeled in your mailboxes for the February uh, issue of We Proceeded On. I, I think you'll enjoy that very much. And we look forward to seeing you at future presentations. Thanks a lot. Thank you for Thank hosting. You, Dr. Beckley. And we'll see you, we hope, in April and then in June. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Stay Thank well. Thank you all. Bye.